Hey everybody, welcome back to this week's edition of Disney History. If you watched our last episode, you know we kind of left on a little bit of a cliffhanger there with a to be continued about the grand opening of Disneyland and how it was kind of a failure, at least looking back on that first opening day in 1955. What we're going to do today, we're going to pick up where we left off, tell you a few stories about the opening day and opening week of Disneyland, some of the things that went wrong, how Walt worked to improve it, and just the different takeaways from the opening of the first Disney theme park. If you guys do enjoy these videos, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff down below, and make sure that you leave a comment if there's a particular aspect of Disney history that you'd like to learn more about. We'll try to work it into an episode somehow in the future. But for now, enjoy the video! When the morning of July 17, 1955 came around, everything was ready for the opening of Disneyland. ABC News reporters were going to be there filming a special called Dateline Disneyland. Walt had sent out 11,000 tickets and press passes to studio workers, construction workers, and local news stations, and celebrities as well to bring everybody he could into the park to witness its opening day. And people lined up by the thousands and tens of thousands just to get a glimpse of the park, even if they couldn't get inside. Now the first issue that happened with the opening of Disneyland was although Walt only printed 11,000 tickets, 28,000 people ended up inside the park by the end of the day, and this was because of a couple reasons. There were counterfeit tickets that were being printed and being released into the park. There was even a gentleman who stacked a ladder up against the back fence of Disneyland and was letting folks over into the park for $5 a pop. And so people started to just flood into the Disneyland park with more than two times, almost three times the amount of guests that they had anticipated. Now mentioning the tickets once again, the very first Disneyland ticket was purchased of course by Roy Disney, Walt's brother. He had arranged for it to be pre-purchased so that he could have ticket stub number one. But the first actual Disneyland ticket that was administered to a guest was administered to a gentleman named David McPherson. And David McPherson actually received a lifetime Disneyland pass that he still uses to this day. He still goes and visits Disneyland and it's expected he has been there over a thousand times, which is pretty cool. But anyways, as opening day rolled around, the first problems were actually in the days leading up to it. There was a plumber strike in Southern California, and Walt had to answer the tough question of whether he wanted to run water to the toilets or the water fountains in the park. They just simply did not have enough manpower left to do both. And this is when Walt was actually quoted in saying that they could drink Coca-Cola, but they couldn't go to the bathroom in the street, which was his way of saying that they absolutely had to have the restrooms available, even if that meant losing out on the water fountains throughout the park. Now, this obviously makes sense if you know the backstory, but most guests didn't, and they accused Disney of price gouging, and that he was forcing people to buy beverages in the park by not having working water fountains and things like that, which would obviously anger some people, but in reality, there was no malintentions behind it. It was just a result of the plumber strike. Now, another problem with the construction was that the asphalt actually arrived late and they only were able to pour the asphalt the day before. Now this was in Southern California in July. On top of all this, they were experiencing record high heat waves of 100 degrees plus Fahrenheit. And when that asphalt was poured down the next morning, it hadn't had enough time to set. And that Anaheim sun came out and just started to bake it and it actually started to get so wet again. As women were walking through the park, they obviously wore heels back in the day to Disneyland. Their heels were getting stuck and they were walking right out of their shoes in Disneyland onto the hot pavement. Obviously there were some complaints of it melting even the bottom of guest shoes and things like that if they had rubber soles to them. Now even amidst all of the chaos of opening of Disneyland, Walt was actually unknown to a lot of it due to the fact that he was so focused on that television special. They were going to be doing a 90 minute segment that ended up being viewed by 90 million people around the country, which is pretty impressive thinking that you know today there's only about 330 million people in the country. So back then it was nearly half the population of the United States was tuned in to watch opening day of Disneyland. I think it ran from 7.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. And as I mentioned in the last video, it was hosted by Ronald Reagan, but also Bob Cummings and Art Linkletter. They were the TV personalities that hosted the opening day festivities. And Walt was able to give his Disneyland opening day speech when he proclaimed to all who come to this happy place, welcome. And this is where he really kind of set out the ideals for what he wanted all the Disney parks to be. When he says, you know, Disneyland is your land, and this is where age relives fond memories of the past, but also youth can cherish the promise of the future. 
Now, like I said, Walt was so preoccupied with the filming that a lot of what was going on in the park really was just up to the individual area managers. And when they started to notice the mass amounts of people that they didn't prepare for, there started to be extremely long queue lines. This on top of the fact that a lot of the attractions were actually down on opening day. They hadn't actually got them up and running. And so the area managers with no formal training yet, they didn't know what to do. And so they started telling the cast members to overload the ride vehicles, actually putting in more people than the recommended amount as an effort to eliminate the lines and like the lengthy waits throughout the park. And guests that were actually in Disneyland on that day recall seeing the water lapping up over the first deck of the Mark Twain Riverboat as it was making its way from the Rivers of America back to its port in Frontierland and it was because that boat was so heavy, it was sitting so low in the water that it actually, you know, kind of started sinking. And so as I mentioned, there were a lot of engineering problems at the opening with the attractions not being fully running. And one of the reasons they believe this happened was because of one of Walt's early engineers and chief engineers in Disneyland, and that gentleman's name was C.V. Wood. Now, C.V. Wood actually did not have an engineering degree. He lied about it through several different career endeavors with the Walt Disney Company and others. He was from Oklahoma, but he pretended to be from Texas. And C.V. Wood wasn't even his real name, I believe. He was a very interesting character. And eventually, he would actually become so disgruntled with Walt and with Disney that he would be kind of asked to leave the company, and he went out to set on his own endeavors with some of Disney's men. And they created a park called Freedom Land in the Bronx in New York. Now, Freedom Land actually had the exact same issues with opening day, which kind of solidified everybody's belief that C.V. Wood was behind the issues at Disneyland. The asphalt was poured too late, there was no water running to the water fountains, half the attractions were down, they also had the same record heat and record crowds. And unfortunately for them, Freedom Land only lasted about four years due to the lack of care and attention to detail that had been implemented in Disneyland that wasn't present in C.V. Wood's park, so unfortunately he went bankrupt and lost that. But, like I was saying, he was kind of responsible for a lot of the issues with Disneyland Park, and there were other rumors of sabotage and things like that. But overall, Disneyland was just such a new idea and new concept. Nobody really knew how to prepare for something like this, so it's really no surprise that opening day was such a disaster, and in years since, they've actually labeled it Black Sunday. That's kind of what it's known in the Disney realm or the Disney community. But July 18th rolled around, Walt started to assess some of the problems with the opening of Disneyland and how he could improve the food service lines, the attractions, um, crowded guest areas and walkways. And it was also on July 18th that a young boy by the name of Tom Nabby actually came to Disneyland Park with his mother. And while he was at Disneyland Park, he actually got a job as a newsie or a newspaper boy selling the Disneyland newspaper on Main Street. And throughout the next year, he would constantly approach Walt Disney asking him for one thing, to make him Tom Sawyer, let him be, you know, friends with Tom Sawyer. And so Walt agreed eventually and said, you know, why would I make you Tom Sawyer when I could just put a mannequin there? And the mannequin wouldn't be running away every half hour to get a hot dog. But Tom Nabby was persistent and Walt gave him a chance. And one of the big stipulations, the hardest part of the job for Tom, was that Walt said he had to maintain a C average every quarter in school. And so every quarter Tom would bring his report card directly to Walt and he always met the requirements, obviously. And he got to be, you know, our first friend of a character in Disney parks. Now, Tom went on to have an amazing career with the Walt Disney Company. He met his wife, who worked concessions in Disneyland. In 1971, he moved over to Florida to open Walt Disney World as a monorail manager. And I think he ended up retiring from Walt Disney World in distribution services sometime in, in the last 20 years, I believe. He was made a Disney legend in the early 2000s, and it's all because he was there the first day of public opening in Disneyland. So it's kind of a cool little story. But as Disneyland continued rolling ahead with its first month and first year of operation, Walt was able to correct many of the problems that they had encountered in that opening week. However, he started to notice that there were also some problems that he couldn't really correct. Problems like seeing cast members dressed in a certain theme passing through another area that they didn't match with. He also noticed one time there were guests fervently running out of the park, and he asked him, where are you going? The park's open for another two hours. And the guests replied to him, can't you see the interstate out there? It's going to take us two hours just to get home. And this was when Walt started to realize, you know, that the outside world was creeping into his Disneyland. And he wanted to stop that. He realized that there were some key aspects of Disneyland, although it was amazing, that he wanted to perfect and take just a little step further. And this was when Walt first started to set his sights on something a little bit bigger. 
Now throughout the years of Disneyland, he started to add more and more attractions. Four years later in 1959, he added the monorail, the Matterhorn. He totally redid Tomorrowland. This was considered Disneyland's second grand opening day. But Walt still wasn't totally satisfied with everything that he was putting in the park. By this time, four years later, there were cheap motels and restaurants and different lodges and places like that popping up along Harbor Boulevard just outside the park. And he felt like he couldn't really maintain his total Disneyland atmosphere with all these other things on the outside starting to slowly creep in. And so Walt had started to set his sights higher. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to create a perfect Disneyland. And this was in the early 1960s. And basically what Walt Disney had in mind was envisioning a whole new Disney world. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you tune in next week to hear more about where the history picks up in the Disney Parks history timeline. If you did like this video, again, just don't forget to like, subscribe, turn on the notifications, leave a comment if you'd like, and we'll see you guys next time. Have a great week.